Good afternoon, everybody. I hope you enjoyed the short break. And thanks for joining us with our talk for about high performance Magnolia with Anycast routing. And thanks to Magnolias for having us. We're quite excited to be here. Uh, let me shortly introduce ourselves. My name is Michael Robertson. I am managing partner and founder of Miranet, a small company situated here in Basel. And this is Matthias Seiler, one of my co-workers, and he is a student at the University of Basel. He studies computer science. Uh, you might have read in the program that he does crazy network stuff with routers and switches. Well, I can assure you it's true, it's true he does. So what's on our agenda today? Um, first, I would like to give you a short portrait of Miranet. Some words on what we do, uh, what's our connection to Magnolia, why are we here, and uh, maybe one or two words on where we want to go and what we want to achieve. Um, after that, we'll move on to our idea. We have a content part and a network part, and we think combining both parts will give us interesting results for Magnolia-driven websites. After that, we'll move on to the topic Anycast routing. Uh, that's when Matthias will take over. Um, we'll have a short overview and introduction. He'll show us how it works. We'll have uh, some in-depth explanations and in the end, some experience and a demonstration. Now for the demonstration, unfortunately, we had bad luck. And at the very last moment, something didn't work out for us. So um, we are very sorry we can't do the demonstration we, we worked on, but uh, we can maybe give a theoretical demonstration instead. Okay, um, so uh, in the end, of course, we'll have questions and answers. I'm sure we'll have enough time for that. So what do we do? Um, on the one hand, we sell Macs. We go and install them alongside with network stuff and servers. We do consulting, provide system administration and support. Um, we do all this for small companies with up to about 70 workstations. Uh, typical, typical customers are graphic artists, advertising agencies, architects, photographers and so on. You know, the typical Mac users. <coughs> um, on the other hand, we have built up a hosting business. Um, today, we host about 500 domains, most of them Magnolia websites, but we also provide GroupRest solutions and PHP alongside with other common hosting services. So that's the other thing we do. In the past year, we have invested a lot in our infrastructure and started to work with a bunch of partners which are listed below. You can see we are a um, select certified Cisco partner. We have EBM, it stands for Elektrobiersek Münchenstein. That's where our servers are located in a data center nearby the city of Basel. We have Tnet and Genotech, which take care of our internet connections and transits. Uh, we are a member of Swiss IX, Swiss Internet Exchange and also RIPE member, and we work closely with VMware. So the result is we now can provide high-class hosting with virtual machines running on a UCS, a unified computing system by Cisco. This is a very intelligent and fully redundant new blade system. We've had it for about six, six weeks now, and we're very proud of it. It's really very cool. Um, our network is handled by Cisco components only. It's multi-homed. We have set up many local, national and international peerings thanks to our own autonomous system with the number you see there with the AS. Um, we are ripe listed local internet registry, which means, for example, that when um, IPv4 addresses start running out, we will still have some. Um, but we already have IPv6 implemented as well, so we are ready for the future. 
Next is, why are we here? What's, what's our connection to Magnolia? Um, I myself was a partner of Pascal's and Boris. Uh, so when Magnolia was born some years back now, I was there and I was responsible for the server infrastructure. So I kept everything running on the technical side. That's what I did in those days together with Pascal and Boris. Um, five years ago, I decided to start my own business and um, I was able to inherit the Mac and Co part we saw before. That's something Pascal and I built up before. So that gave me a good basis to start a new business. And on the other hand, Magnolia has enough time to, um, to develop their CMS and to make it such a great product, which it is today. Uh, because I was um, involved with, with, um, with Magnolia from the beginning on, I then soon decided to provide Magnolia hosting. There was a um, big demand for this in those days, and there still is, so <laughs> we were quite happy about that. Um, before the company Magnolia moved their offices earlier this year, they decided to put the management of their, ser their server inf infrastructure in our hands. So what we did is we moved all their services to our infrastructure and we now manage them for them. So everything server-based with Magnolia is running on our uh, servers and uh, we are running them for them. So that's why we work very closely together with Magnolia. And uh, the, the server farm they used to have in-house is, is history, it's gone. So that's an advantage for them. Um, one or two words on where we want to go. Uh, we want to take our hosting services a step higher, which we already have, actually, with, uh, with the infrastructure. But uh, we're still working at the moment on the services and management. So we can, in the end, provide high-class enterprise hosting for customers with high demands. <clears throat> so what's our idea? Um, as you all probably know, Magnolia CMS has this cool feature and ability of, um, of publishing content to multiple server nodes. An author instance can broadcast new or edited content to several public instances. This is nothing new. Oh no, it's, it's, used, for, um, it's used for load balancing installations, for instance. That's the most common setup we see today. Uh, this is nothing new. We've had that for a long time. It's built in in Magnolia. And uh, it can be configured here right within Admin Central under subscribers. So, as I said, nothing new, old story, but let's just call this the content part. So, what about the network part? The network part is about integrating best practice addressing and routing methods. They will give us interesting results, as I said before, from, from Magnolia, uh, Magnolia websites. Um, what we want to get out of this combination of both parts is, on the one hand, high availability and, on the other hand, um, low latency for, this, for websites hosted this way. So let's first have a short overview on routing methods. Um, top left, we have Unicast. Unicast is commonly used on the Internet. Uh, requests are sent to a single network destination ident identified by a unique address. Um, I'm sure you all know this. This is happening all the time on the Internet. Um, broadcasting is typically used within local area networks. That means transmitted packages from a single point will be received by every device on the network, but only if they have to. A good example for this is, for instance, the, the DHCP protocol. Uh, the clients in the network always ask for DHCP, and um, when it needs, to, needs the information, we'll get it. So this is broadcasted all the time. Um, multicast is the, 
delivery of information from one to many. So that means nodes on the network, such as switches and routers, take care of replicating the packets to each multiple receivers, to reach multiple receivers. Um, IP multicast is uh, used, for instance, in applications for streaming media and internet television. So probably just what these guys are doing right now. And in Anycast, in the end, is the method where packets from a single sender are routed to the nearest node in a group of potential receivers. And that's what's, what's interesting for us. And uh, that's what we're going to talk about in the next few minutes. So, uh, first an example. Uh, maybe first Unicast. Uh, we have the world here with many, many, many routers, much more than we see here. And uh, let's suppose we have a, a server sitting in Europe somewhere, hosting a bunch of websites. And now what happens if somebody over here in the United States, he calls up one of these websites, so he will get routed all the way to that server. The website will build up in his browser eventually, but it will take some time because there are many hops on the way. On the other hand, if we have someone over here, let's say a, a fisherman in his fishing boat, um, he will have a much shorter latency or lower latency because there are less hops on the way. I think that's quite clear. So we were thinking of a way, how can we do this, that lots of users get the same kind of low latency and at the same time um, uh, the best availability of websites. So um, this, is, um, this is where uh, the interesting part, part uh, starts. And the first thing we will need, of course, is more servers. So let's say we have three servers, and now very important, those three servers, or more of course, they will need to have the, exactly the same content. And that's the content part again where Magnolia comes in, because uh, Magnolia has this feature of publishing to, to several public instances. So how are we going to do this network part now? So um, this is where the weird stuff be uh, begins, and I'm going to hand over to Matthias. Thank you. Yes, what's Anycast? Anycast is, there's no magic about it. It's just, it's all about addressing. So what you need to do Anycast is a bunch of routers and addresses. What you see here is an IPv4 address and an IPv6 address need to get used to such things in the future, the near future. <coughs> so what you need is addresses, routing or routers, and then you're done. I think uh, most of you know what happens if you assign the same IP address to the same machine in a local network, or to a different machine in, a, in the same network. <laughs> Bloody thing doesn't work, right? So, yeah, duplicate address detection mechanisms complain about another machine having the same address, etc. You can't get access to the network, right? Are you sure? <laughs> so the only thing you need is to add routers. That's all you need. And we have routers on the internet. The internet is actually based on routers. So if we show our map again here, we place some servers, server in the United States, server in Europe, and server in Australia, for example. And we also put some routers there, router in the United States, router in Australia, and router in Europe. And now here comes the magic. All of these three machines, or so three servers, have the exactly the same, same IP address be it v4 or v6, doesn't depend. So how do we do that? <coughs> Each of these routers here is announcing the same prefix or the same range of IP addresses into the internet. So every router tells the other routers in the internet, hey, I'm able to 
to reach these addresses just behind me. So if you want to get traffic to that address, just send it to me. Now, let's recall our many routers in the internet. So I've put some there. And let's say what happens if a user in China calls up a website, said magnoliacms.com. He gets an IP address from the DNS system and then tries to reach that IP address via his next router. This router, you all know this router, it's the default gateway usually. So that's the nearest router he can reach and that router needs to get the packet to the destination. Therefore, he asks, well, he asks the other routers or his neighbors, his PGP neighbors. And these routers already told him uh, their view of the internet, it, their view of the internet. So <coughs> he gets to the decision where he wants to go. And that's always the shortest path, or the, short, the, the path with the least hops. That's how the internet works, basically. So now let's get to an interesting part of that. Let's say this user in China calls that website again, and now the server breaks down. So what happens now? I assume you need to fly to Australia and repair the servers. But we don't do that because we have any cost. So what happens is this packet gets to the router. The router asks his neighbors, where should I get this packet to? And these routers in turn ask their routers or their neighbors, do you know about that destination? And the packet goes on. And as you see, it takes the shortest path possible. And now we find the user sees the website. He's got a little bit more latency than before because he needs to reach a, a server in Europe, which is far, more f far away uh, and not in, not in his neighborhood, if you want, network-wise. But it's not, not that bad. He can still read the website, the website, which is important, or which is the thing we want to achieve here. So if you've got any questions, please ask them later. Any cost is, is not new. It's not magic and it's not new. So it's about 70 years old or as much as old as the internet itself. So the first RFC I found on Google uh, with the term any cost in it is RFC 1546 and it's written in 1993. So that's where, oh, when private IP addresses were born. So pretty old. It's now to today, it's used for DNS already and uh, big scale. So if you ask, the, uh, or if you ask um, where or which IP address has magnolia slash cms.com, uh, you get, you ask the DNS system and the DNS system is built out of, or the base for that, for the top level domain is built on 13 root servers. In the early days of the internet, they're really where 13, 13 machines, which actually answered these root uh, questions. Where is .ch, where is .de, where is .com? <coughs> Nowadays, uh, this third, this, it, got, it gets a lot of traffic, so these 13 servers were not enough. They need to cluster it. And today we have nine out of 13 root servers are anycasted, so that means you have, still have 13 logical uh, root servers, but many, many physical servers. And you also see the, the principle of the internet to, to decentralize things is achieved via any cost. You, have, you still have one small problem, or one small yeah, important thing. <laughs> With DNS, you get one packet out, and you get one packet back. That's all, that's all you want to know. With websites, it's different. You get many packets out and many packets back. That's what, uh, a small problem of any cause. So that's why, that's why it's not used yet for website in that scale, in, in, big, in a big scale. <coughs> so you have several problems. You have the problem of content synchronization. You need to get the exact same content at the same time on different servers all over the world. 
That's possible with Magnolia, it's no problem. <coughs> you have connection-oriented protocols, that means uh, once you have a connection with a, with a server in Australia, and the server in Australia goes down, your connection is down too. So that's, that's a problem. But that's also a problem in Unicast. So it's not worse or something. <laughs> you have also problems with long-lived downloads. Uh, let's say a big PDF, uh, large-scale porn downloads, for example. It's just that, that's going to be a problem with any cast, but not that much of a, of a problem like it's in Unicast, as I said before. So you, oh, sorry. <laughs> you only have problems if the internet goes crazy, and that doesn't happen um, all the time. So perhaps once a year or so. But think of it, of the principle, if you have several servers all distributed all around the world, you're pretty much safe if there are some large-scale attacks, um, let's say, some DDoS attacks or so, if, the, if, if you have a cable break on some, some C cables or, or other weird things, but it's not that common, fortunately. So that's pretty much it. Um, as Michael said before, we have no demonstration for you, sadly, uh, but we can talk about our experiences <coughs> we achieve with any casting. Uh, what we have done now is we asked RIPE NCC for a new AS number, because we need that to do any cast. They gave it to us, and also the prefix uh, in IPv6. We still wait for the prefix in IPv4. It's kind of different, uh, difficult nowadays, because there aren't that many addresses anymore. But we, we have done some testing over IPv6, and it went pretty well, actually. That means we had no uh, big problems with reachability, if you, if, if you take down a server or a router, that went pretty well. And also the syn content synchronization. You still need unicast addresses on these machines, uh, but the user actually had, uh, the, the site had no downtime during testing, 100% uptime. Yeah, that's actually what, what we want to do also in the future. I think Michael has some things to say about that. Thanks. Yeah, well, um, we're a little bit short now because we, the demonstration couldn't take place. We're very sorry about that. Um, but, um, well, what can we say? Um, in the future, we would, like to, we would like to achieve this. This is something we were going to do, and we're going to work on it. Um, so all we need is some, some servers all, our, all around the world. <laughs> Not very easy and routers as well, but uh, we think it it's, uh, could probably be quite a good idea and, and uh, let's see what happens. So that's our talk, thank you very much for listening and um, we now have some time for questions and answers if you wish. The question was, um, are we expecting that uh, Magnolia is used for this all the time or other caching mechanisms, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay, one scenario we have in mind for that is we have a central server, like an, an author instance, and then you have many, many public instances which have a unicast address and each of them the anycast address. So you publish it via uh, your author instance and then you have the site running on the public instances. It's not about caching. Caching is too, much, too complicated for, that, for, for any cast. The service is just out of the box you need to set up this especially or program it for the caching mechanisms to work because they need to synchronize its content. So you probably need some sort of remote transactional safe databases or something. I'm pretty sure some guys in here are able to do that, <laughs> but uh, we are not. We are just providing the network and the service for that. What you do with it, it's in, in your hands, but what you need is the network and this, the distributed server, and that's what we do. Yeah. One thing which, which we should mention here is also that uh, when the website um, gets content from the user, when, when you have user-driven content, then it won't work anymore because then you'll have different content on the one server that the user is working on right at the moment. 
So then it will fail, what one could say. But um, maybe this is a, some, something one could build in into Magnolia, so that's also that kind of inf information will be replicated to every single server posted mm -hmm. this way. Well, it will not fail. It will just be visible on the node yeah. nearest to the, to the clients in that country, for example. If a user adds a, co a comment or a post to a forum on the node in Australia, it's only visible there. So you need to have for the program mechanisms to get up these contents to other nodes. So it's flushed. OK, um, you, you were asking about if you get diff different content based on your country, is that right? No? Or just the same content, but in different locations, right? OK, what? That's the principle, yeah. Um, if you can show the map uh, yeah. before. Well, you have these three. Let's assume you have these three servers. And you have exactly the same content on these three servers. So there's no difference for the users in South America or the users in Europe or the users in Australia. You have exactly the same content. But if you have a user, for example, in Australia, and if the internet service provider in Australia does his things right, <laughs> he gets to that server because that's the shorter pass, usually. <laughs> so that, that's some quirks about the internet, but usually you get, you, you're pretty, it's pretty good, you get, or the chances are pretty high you get to that server. And the other server are not, are not contacted. So what you, what you have here is just a connection, basically a unicast connection to that server. It, it doesn't even know about the other servers. So it doesn't, just the internet as a whole does know about different servers. That's yeah. It's about it's about late. This is the latency part here. That's uh, when all three servers are running, and the user in Australia calls up the website, and he'll get an answer from the server in Australia, of course. But if the server goes down, then it will it, it won't be it will still be available because he'll uh, he'll then get to the server in Europe, but just the shortest one. The, the nearest one in, it, in his neighborhood. Mm -hmm. So that means that's the, that's the access, the availability part. Mm -hmm. and, and the other servers have the same IP, right? Yeah, so right. Uh, yeah. 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 It's always the same IP addresses for different servers. Yeah. That's the magic, yeah. actually. Yeah. Well, you were asking if um, this is already working or in a working state. Oh, yeah, actually, what you're talking about is geo, uh, geocaching or geolocating, or no, not geolocating, geocasting, yeah, right? Um, what happens for Google, for example, has many, many servers around the world, and what they do is they have many, many addresses and assign these addresses to each server. So you have different addresses for different servers. What they do is uh, if a user in Australia asks the DNS for google.com, he gets an IP address which is in Australia. If the server goes down, uh, they need to, to reprogram the DNS or the DNS database so it answers another, with another IP address. There you have problems like the, the caching delays, the details and that. But yeah. if, if you have an any cost of the infrastructure and the server goes down, the router immediately retrieves, uh, uh, re, is that not? withdraws the, the, the prefix, the IP prefix, and says, I have no idea about this IP address. Go somewhere else. And that's what it does. It goes somewhere else. That's actually, it's immediate. That's the difference. Um, I think Akama is doing such a thing now for, for distributing its downloads or streaming, streaming things. Uh, yeah. what, what you're asking is, uh, is per packet load balancing a problem with any cost, and it is. But it is also a problem with unicast. So it's, it's actually quite bad if you do per packet load balancing. You, should, you shouldn't do it on the internet, but that's, that's another, another thing. <laughs> so usually, or the default also in Cisco gear, is if you, do, if you have two paths with the same cost, um, it is connection oriented. So the router knows or it caches this. So if you um, send traffic to a destination which is uh, in between somewhere load balanced, 
you have a cached root, root lookup. So <coughs> if I ask, for example, Google for their website and its, it's uh, load balance, which it is, uh, then it gets for, this con for my connection or for my Google searches, it's always the same path. And for the other user, perhaps, it's another path. So it, that's per, per session load balancing or per IP load balancing, if you want. But per packet load balancing is bad per se, and it gets even worse with any cost. But we have, we have some, we've read uh, or found some papers about exactly that thing, and they found out it's not that common. So because any cost is on, on a worldwide scale, and load balancing usually is on a local scale, on a local basis. So you get out to different routers, perhaps, or to different ISPs, but in the end, you get to the same server because it's worldwide. Any cost doesn't quite make sense in this, in this use case if you have it local. That's okay. You were asking about if, you, if Google has problems with uh, search engine optimization, right? Yeah. Uh, with any cost. And what I can say is each user or each client on the network doesn't know you are any costed. So it doesn't know that IP address is actually any cost because he looks it up, he sends traffic to it, and he gets traffic back. That's all he knows. Yeah. They don't see different servers. For Google, these servers are exactly the same. They're giving the same answers for the same questions. Yeah, it is, but what you're talking about is actually quite expensive. You need to do BGP table lookups. All the time, you, uh, Google indexes, and Google has a very short amount of time to, to crawl the internet, so I'm pretty sure they don't. And it doesn't, well, it, I, I don't think it's, it's that of a kind of a problem, because you're mixing two technologies. You're, technologies. you're mixing the network with the content. And Google does care about the content and not that much about the network where it comes from. But it could, it could be a problem, perhaps, yeah. We don't know. <laughs> well, just to, re to repeat it again, for every user on the, net, on the internet, that IP address belongs to one network. That's our network. So with DNS, you do it otherwise. You have different networks announcing the same prefix, which is actually bad for TCP any cost like we do. Um, we, are use, we are actually extending our own network over the world. With, it's, just quite, it's actually quite easy. You need to send the router to America and then announce this prefix. That's all. <laughs> Okay. And yeah. That's well, that that's an interesting point. The geo IP of uh, or the yeah, databases which map IP addresses and uh, geographical locations or, or countries. Um, that's not going to be a problem because our IP prefix is registered in Switzerland. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, but if you use uh, geo IP databases, you know about that problem. It's not always right, or most of the time it's not right. You, you often have, also Akamai, for example, has this problem, because you, perhaps they're using IP addresses in Europe which are registered on, on, from, on the RAR in America. So they get it from Erin and they announce it in Europe. That happens all the time. But that's actually how the internet works. It's decentral, decentralized. Okay, yeah. Time's up, no more questions. <laughs> <laughs> uh, are there some more questions? <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs>